What if I told you that there is a way of building an SSTO purely for looks, yet still making it highly capable? Capable enough of transporting 21 kerbals to lay them back, all without refueling. Well, that's exactly what I did, and here's how I managed to pull it off. The first and most pressing issue that I had to address is one that literally every interplanetary SSTO has to deal with. Hydrogen tanks don't look good on space planes. Yet, due to hydrogen's extremely low density, the tanks usually make up the majority of the craft. The easiest solution here would be to simply not use hydrogen, but chemical SSTOs are very limited in the amount of delta V that they can have. And with the swerve having more than 4 times higher efficiency than any other chemical engine, we basically have to use it. The most obvious solution here would be to simply cover up the hydrogen tanks with a fairing. But, unfortunately, fairings, among many other parts, are still affected by an extremely annoying drag bug. Not only does this bug prevent cargo bays and fairings from shielding their payloads from drag, but the fairing itself also generates massive drag of its own. In fact, the fairing alone can be responsible for as much as 75% of the vessel's total drag. However, there is a workaround. If, instead of trying to gather speed low down, we ascend up to around 10 kilometers, and only then start gathering speed for our circularization, we can minimize the impact of our craft's sub-optimal drag performance. This works because 10 kilometers of altitude is a sweet spot where the atmosphere is thin enough for our drag to not really matter as much, but at the same time, is still thick enough for our jets to operate at their rated power outputs. Now, this is still a compromise, and it's not a perfect solution by any means, but it's just about the only way of actually making our journey to life possible. But why are we even going to Lave? Aren't there other planets and moons that are a lot easier to get to? Well, Lave is the undisputed SSTO mecha of the Kerbal system, since it's the only other planet, or moon, that has an oxygenated atmosphere. This means that you can actually use jet engines on Lave. But the good news don't end there. Both its surface gravity and atmospheric density is scaled down by about 20 and 40% respectively, compared to Kerbin. This means that space planes flying around in Lave's atmosphere will handle nearly identically to how they handle back on Kerbin, yet require far less engines and fuel to recircularize. However, even though Lave is the perfect destination for any SSTO trying to prove its worth, it still requires a fair amount of delta V to get there, and as per our mission goals, we will need to do so while ferrying 21 Kerbals. To actually achieve our goal, our craft will have to be as efficient as possible, while making near zero compromises in terms of its looks. The quote unquote easiest way of making an SSTO both look cool and still perform is to spend a lot of time on the wing design. Procedural wings are extremely handy here, since they allow us to create just about any design that we can think of. Our imagination truly is the limit when it comes to wing designs. However, there are some rules that we do need to follow when designing a more complex wing like this. Well, at least if we want our craft to actually be functional and not just look cool. The most important part is to keep all of our wing pieces perfectly in line with the airstream. This will greatly reduce our overall drag and make a wing design like this no less efficient than a regular straight wing. For our engines, I knew I wanted to use exactly 4 whiplashes for aesthetic reasons, and I wanted to encase them in their own enclosure to sort of integrate them into the wing itself. Since our triangular ship wing is not quite tall enough to fit two whiplashes side by side, I decided to make a raised part of the wing towards the back of the craft specifically for housing the jets, and I think it turned out pretty nice. Now, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. These builds usually take a lot of time and fine tuning, so it really wouldn't work if I sped up a several hour long clip down to a minute. The only thing that would achieve is giving someone a seizure. Instead, what I do is rebuild the whole craft while trying to move the camera as little as possible, and then edit it into a time lapse that's a lot more enjoyable to watch. Typically, I can build an exact replica of the original craft. But since this SSTO has a lot of parts that were moved around without the magnet tool, you guys might notice some minor differences in the actual mission craft. Speaking of which, it looks like past me is just about done with the build. So let's go back to the future. As you guys can probably see from the aero debug menu on the right, our thrust to drag ratio is really bad in the lower atmosphere. This craft can barely reach Mach 1 on the deck. 
Because of it, we will be ascending at a pretty steep angle until we get higher into the atmosphere. As soon as we level off at that magical 10 km mark, our speed starts to climb rapidly and we're actually able to gather a lot of speed before needing to switch to the swerve. Now, I gotta say guys, I'm really happy with how this craft turned out. I feel like it looks more like a supersonic bomber rather than a passenger airliner. Well, a bomber with a massive rocket engine on the back of it. It's also very stable both in the vacuum and atmosphere. However, if you guys do decide to try this craft out, I'd suggest you don't do non-physical time warp burning. For some reason, this craft will teleport outside of the curveball system if you try it. Anyway, with our SST on orbit, I plotted a course for Jewel and initiated the burn. Thankfully, our inability of using non-physical time warp burning wasn't really an issue since our TDR in space was relatively high and we could complete our burns pretty fast. Once we got out into deep space, we performed a mid-course correction burn to not get a lathe intercept. Since, of course, our trajectory changed randomly once we entered Jules' sphere of influence. After doing another corrective burn to account for the first of many bugs on our journey, we executed an error break around lathe and proceeded to waste a bunch of fuel to get a cinematic landing. Since our Kerbals weren't very picky about which parts of life they wanted to see, we didn't really care about where we land. As long as we landed on solid ground, we'd be good. However, things did not go quite as smoothly as I would have liked them to. You guys are actually watching my second attempt at landing on life. On the first one, one of the three landing gears refused to deploy, which is <laughs> suboptimal. Oddly enough, I actually could deploy all of my landing gears properly while in orbit. So on my second attempt, I simply reorbited with the landing gears already extended. Once safely on the ground, we let our Kerbals out to stretch their legs and take in the views. And now, here comes by far the hardest part of our mission. And no, I'm not talking about recircularizing around life. My original plan was to perform a series of gravity assists around Tylo in order to get back to Kerbin basically for free, and then to finish things off, land on either Daman or Minmus. But after literally 4 hours of trying to pull it off, I came to realize that it's just far too tedious to do. The main issue that I was dealing with is, of course, the trajectory line bug, which made it borderline impossible to set up a series of gravity assists with numerous fear of influence transitions. And to make things worse, our craft did not have enough delta V to perform a direct curb and intercept. However, there is still a way. Due to how KSP simulates gravity, we are technically outside of Joule's sphere of influence when we're in Lave's orbit. This means that we can actually perform a gravity assist around Joule directly from Lave. However, to actually pull it off, we will need to time our burn very precisely. We will need to execute our burn during a curb and transfer window with Lave being perfectly lined up between Jewel and the Sun, and our Jewel exit trajectory has to be facing 180 degrees away from the Sun. If all of these conditions are met, the only guesswork we have to do is how much we have to burn. Now, this isn't exactly the easiest thing to pull off, but after another hour of trial and error, I managed to get a pretty good trajectory out of Lave to Kerbin. Once we got out into deep space, we performed a series of corrective burns to fine-tune our Kerbin encounter. And once actually at Kerbin, we executed a pretty aggressive aero break to capture. And then a series of smaller, more controlled aero breaks to reduce our orbit. Since we were basically out of fuel, we didn't have enough delta V to correct our orbit. And as always, the KSC was on the dark side of the planet. This meant that I had to do a lot of small aero breaks to fine-tune our eventual descent to the KSC. In order to actually land on the runway, I had to do a slightly unorthodox re-entry. We start off by descending to about 25 kilometers in order to scrub off enough speed as to not go back into space, and then ascend slightly higher to extend our glide range. Then we simply had to control our altitude and speed until we were close enough to the KSC, where we could pitch down and go for the landing. But since this is KSP2, we had one last issue to deal with. You guys remember the landing gear bug back at Lave? Yeah, only the front landing gear deployed. I quickly tried a lot of ways of making the rear legs come down as well, but they simply refused to move. 
I also couldn't just deorbit with the legs already deployed, since the extra drag from our gears would slow us down too much and we wouldn't make it to the KSC. The way I saw it, I had two options, either revert to a quick save before our very first curve and arrow break, or try to land with only the front gear. Obviously, it didn't go very well. However, after loading a quick save, another one of our three landing legs deployed. This actually gave us a fighting chance. And after a lot of failed attempts, against all odds, I managed to successfully land the craft. As always, I'm Kermabon Brown, and I'll see you in the next one.